So when you think about the restaurant owner, bar owner, or the, you know, the widget manufacturer, you know, they're operating their business, but when they're trying to raise capital, they got to get their paperwork uh, documented. So obviously, you know, um, formation in terms of the, the type of company it is, there has to be an audit that takes place in equity crowdfunding. Um, if you raise zero to $250,000, it could be self-reported financial. So like, hey, I'm the CEO, this is my income statement, this is my balance sheet and so forth. When it's 250 to a million, um, it has to be CPA reviewed. So you have to pay a CPA to review it mm -hmm. for the last two years. Uh, if it's a million to five million, it's a full CPA audit. My graduates from my school being Forbes, bag drop. Bag drop. <laughs> a mic drop. Bag drop. Bag drop. All right, guys, welcome back. EYL, we are in our Atlanta headquarters. Sozy. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> so this is an uh, episode that is going to be extremely educational. I already know off the rip. Um, so when we talk about funding a business, a lot of times people hear about like venture capital yes. or they know like, you know, just liquidate the money that they have. Sure. But um, equity crowdfunding is something that we spoke about a while ago. Shout out to Mike Brown. He was, I think was the first person on our yes, platform. Two years ago, man. that's he crazy. Was, he was on a perspective of actually raising money. Mm -hmm. So he sp he came and he spoke about equity crowdfunding, um, but it has it hasn't been something that we really have touched on. So Pierre Velo Velo Lavo Lavo close enough. Yeah, the, the L person. Sorry, yeah. bro. Yeah, I've been Lebeau, called Lebeau, Lebeau. Lebeau. <laughs> Lebeau. Lebeau. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> my bad. No worries. So um, actually came to our event in LA. Yep, I did. Right. So. Um, he is has an interesting story. He's from LA originally, but then was a 10 year veteran of Wall Street, yep. worked on Wall Street for 10 years um, as a banker, and now actually has a startup company called Seed at the Table, right. where it's a black owned uh, a black owned equity crowdfunding platform, right. uh, similar to like Republic or something like that, right? right? Where now you can actually go on the platform and A, if you're a business, you can be listed. Yep. And if you're an investor, you can look for opportunities to invest in a business because that's something that a lot of people always talk about. Like, well, how can I find these deals to invest in early if I'm not, you know, so that's what the equity crowdfunding. So we'll explain what equity crowdfunding is, the platform, all of that stuff. But this is an extremely important episode for a business owners, yeah. but also <clears throat> from investors as well to be educated on how to invest in startup companies. So yeah. this is going to be dope. Shout out to my man, Lou Tucker, for putting this together the last sure, episode. Um, Lewis. Yeah, <laughs> he's going by Lewis now. And um, <laughs> first and foremost, thank you for joining us. Appreciate yeah. it. No, I, we, yeah. we we said LA, but specifically Compton. Yeah, well, since we Compton Long Beach area, so my dad is from Compton. No, we want we got to make yeah, sure so, that we rest. So I went I went to Poly High. So like when you're from LA, like the the, the delineating factor is where'd you go to high school? <laughs> like really, like dudes like oh you see like where'd you go to? So I went to Poly High. So I'm like yeah. a Long Beach kid through and through. Uh, as you mentioned, I was in New York for for ten years. I was a banker at Goldman. Um, as we talked about earlier, I never got rid of my California ID. Uh, yeah, man, so just kind of like you know, ears to the streets, always tapped in, um, which just kept me grounded. But it was definitely frustrating in, in New York working on Wall Street just in terms of like fit perspective. But we can you know, talk about that for another Yeah, video. so let's talk about that. <laughs> oh, right. We talk about it now. All right, so, cool. yeah, let's get into yeah. it. So, all right, so coming from, from Long Beach, yeah. and that's a long way from Wall Street. Yeah. So how'd you make your way from from California so, and you was working at Goldman Sachs, right? Correct. Yeah. What, what was your exact role? In yeah. So, so I think it's, I think what's important in life, man, is like when you hear about these stories, like what can be replicated. People tell you like, oh, I did this, all that. It's like, yo, like let me know how you started, so I can know if it's like attainable to me. So, went to public, went to Poly High, four thousand kids uh, on MLK to kind of give you perspective, right? Right next to the Poly apartment, it's like projects at the time. Uh, went to Long Beach State undergrad, public school. I went to U University of Virginia for business school, mm. right? And so got an MBA. So that allowed me to pivot. To banking, but before that, man, when I was an undergrad, I was a social science major. I wanted to be a, I was a psychology anthropology major. I wanted to get a PhD in psychology, like help the community. Yeah, uh, and that was like my first job out of undergrad, actually. So um, when I went to business school, that's when I found out about banking, investment banking, and you know, and on, on the West Coast, banking isn't big at all. It's like I know entertainment and so forth. Um, I had a bank account at a regular bank, but like you know, even today, my parents still don't understand what banking is, or my sister. But to answer your question, um, I manage money. When I was in when I was in New York, so I worked at Goldman. I was in their investment management division, so I managed money for individuals, uh, you know, ball players, uh, people that create notepads and made thirty, forty million dollars. Like right? wealth, wealth management, wealth management, yeah, and then foundations as well. So, um, 
you know, it's a very, it's a, the minimum at that time, this is back from like 08 to 2019, because things have changed, the firm was like a $20 million account, liquid though. So not real estate, right? Mm-hmm. So when you think about people that have $20 million of liquid capital, they walk a very different form of life, right? Um, so my job was to you know, get to know them, build relationships, but actually to really manage their, I, I was their guy. It wasn't like I was reporting to somebody else. Like, so my firm, my first account was, he was a, was a French man. He's probably that I was, I'm not French. He thought I was French. We talked about this. Um, you know, the last thing may <laughs> have you confused, but shout out to the Haitians <laughs> out there. Um, but nonetheless, um, he thought I was French, but he was a founder of a, uh, of a publicly traded company. Ex McKinsey guy, like real cerebral. And he would call the desk, bro, and he would literally say, Is Pierre there? It wasn't like any of the older white dudes. It was like, Is Pierre there? So I was this guy, I was trading derivatives for him, managing markets. And um, so in that seat, though, it allowed me to see so much deal flow. And from a context perspective, you know, at that time in my group, there were about 400 of us advisors. There were probably about 15 black advisors. Um, I was one of two in New York, but I was very much, I was more so street facing, right? Like I was, you know, I kind of knew everybody and was being helpful to everybody. So when there was, when it came to like having a relationship at Goldman, it was like Pierre was one of the first guys you would reach out to, even if it wasn't a fit, um, just to be a resource. So, you know, it was, a, it was a great experience to that extent in terms of like being a resource for the people, but in terms of like managing money for an, uh, a profile that was drastically different. The mind, like yeah. that was. A, I wasn't going. To, I wasn't going to the Hamptons on the weekend. Yeah, that, so yeah like, that, run, I didn't roll crew. Yeah. yeah, like you know, it was very different. That so, like when you said fit, that's what I'm automatically thinking, right? Like yeah. you have a salary, but you're managing millions and oh, billions man. of dollars. So, like going to work on a daily basis, like what's that like? Because a lot of us have never even seen that type of money, and I had to manage it. So, what's that like? So when I when I got the gig, I had to literally describe it to my homie, my friends, like yo, it's like the equivalent of getting drafted by the Lakers. Because dudes didn't really get, like, they didn't really get it, right? Like, all the, all the people that, like, are B-School, like, all the book smart dudes, like, they get it. Like, oh, you work at Goldman, one of the best firms at the time. But I got to say, like, like you know, getting drafted by the Lakers. So, for me, I was just happy to be there. Also, the challenge was, like, especially within our community, like, I don't want to mess things up, right? It's like, you kind of, like, keep your head down. Yeah. You're not really loud and vocal. So, it was more of a surreal feeling um, being there. I would say one of the benefits, though, is that... Although it was frustrating, I saw so much deal flow. Like I'm like, so now when you think about it, literally talking to somebody that makes like notepads and sold their business for thirty million dollars, like I can make a notepad, right? So like you see so many ideas and how people have accumulated wealth and are are are, are creating businesses and transacting on those businesses. But then you also learn the dirty in terms of like how they're actually starting their businesses, right? In terms of like where did they start from? Did you kind of build it from the ground up, or did somebody cut you that check, you know, to give you the first million dollars so you can scale? So mm-hmm. um. It was definitely an eye-opening experience for sure. So you, you said working on Wall Street, seeing deal flow, you saw that the black how black companies weren't being funded. Yeah, yep. Yeah. So Talk about that a little bit. Yeah. So my my friend network man, uh, literally is like older black man from like fifty to seventy, and like a bunch of my young boys and obviously our peers, our age group. Um, and the reason why I, br- I bring that up is that when I was in New York, like I used to work with a bunch of like senior partners at law firms. So I was always giving them like. A firm would reach out to me. It's like, hey, I'm doing $7 million in revenue. Um, can go home and IPO me. And I was like, nah, you probably need like two zeros behind you. <laughs> but I can introduce you to a middle market banker. Or I can introduce you to, um, you know, an attorney, right? They can like actually structure the deal. So I was always giving out opportunities that weren't necessarily a fit for uh, for the firm. And, you know, when you think about the minimums in terms of transacting, you know, they were looking at deal $100 million companies, right? And like, we don't, we're not in that space yet. Minimal. And yeah, because yeah, yeah, like, they got to get their fees in terms yeah. of like the investment yeah, yeah, things, yeah. right? So my group was always about trading on information, like literally positioning people to get deals done. So what the goal is you help them sell their business. And then when they sell their business, they bring the money back to you and you manage it. But I saw so many businesses, man, that are out there that are doing, you know, three to $5 million that couldn't get funding from a bold rack investment bank, um, let alone funding from some of the other resources or other, like, Pipe our other access points of capital. I'd love to talk to you guys about that. What yeah. that looks like from, from an entrepreneur's perspective. Too. So, so in terms of funding, right? We got Goldman up here, hundred million is the minimum. Yeah. But what's that mid range? Is there like a number, a scale that 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 um and like yeah. wealth managers use that like if it's ten million, it has to be this level bank. If it's fifty million, so it's this level. Yeah. So I mean, let me differentiate the two. So to have your your assets managed at the time, it was like twenty million dollars of liquid net worth, right? Okay. But then when you think about a business that may not even be liquid yet, that wants to sell their business, they want to sell that notepad company for $300 million, it has to be at least a $100 million transaction, right? So like that's the difference between the two. So one is getting your your assets managed, and the other is 
when you um when you're trying to engage an investment bank of that caliber to do the deal, it has to be worth a certain amount. It has to be worth their time. But there are tons of middle what's called middle market bankers, right? That, yeah. So the middle market bankers are typically you know regional smaller banks, uh, still notable. I mean, I think there's like excellence el- everywhere. Right? You don't got to be at a, a certain firm. I think there's like brilliance uh, everywhere. But um, nonetheless, they're situated where they can take on those size deals. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's just like in the eco, you guys see more deals than I do now. But right, like in the eco, like there's so many interesting companies out there that are looking for access to capital and and it's been a challenge, right? And for a number of varying reasons we can dig into, but in that room, when I worked in that capacity, it was more so like, I have a company that's worth a hundred million, help me sell it, if you help me sell it, or your firm sells it and I'll bring you the asset. So, all right, so talk about, let's get into the equity crowdfunding conversation. Yeah. What made you want to start Seat at the Table? Yeah, man, it's, um, I think I caught the interview with, you said the brother's name was Mike. I think I caught yeah. the interview, Mike uh, Brown, yeah. yeah, I think I caught that interview, man. It's like, I was randomly in a Starbucks and, and I was just frustrated because like I would always when I whenever I get a, whenever I would get a deal I would reach out to my network of angel investors wealthy individuals it's, it's a small handful right it's not a lot of us and um, I'm sure they got tired of receiving they they appreciated the call but you know we all get tired of being hit up at the same time so um I spent a year working at a commercial bank uh, so what's different about like commercial bank you think about like a Bank of America where you have your deposits and whatever right I worked at a commercial bank on the West Coast. I'm like, well, I'm working at the small regional commercial bank. Now I can like really extend capital and help people get loans and so forth. And I realized how hard it was in that space, right? Yeah, no, so I was, I was watching it. I was, so I was at Starbucks. I was frustrated. And I was watching like YouTube videos and like randomly at the equity crowdfunding popped up. I knew nothing about it. I've never even invested in an equity crowdfunding portal before that. Uh, we all, not we, most of our community knows about GoFundMe and Kickstarter for varying reasons, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but equity crowdfunding was was different at the time. So I saw like this episode from this other one of the competing portals and i was like oh this is interesting and i a point to like raise capital at lower dollar amounts right where everybody the community can participate um did tons of research and i quickly realized that there was no portals that was um intentionally focused on black and brown entrepreneurs right uh, so the name is called it's called seed at the table yeah. and it's a play of having a seat at the table or a lack thereof right so we don't often have a, a seat at the table for yeah. deal flow so gathered a group of my friends who i call family with the process of getting approved by the SEC and FINRA. So, like, all the portals are listed and they're approved. It's like yeah. the equivalent of can, can you explain what FINRA is? Yeah, thank you, bro. Because, like, sometimes you get caught yeah, up in Yeah, yeah, yeah. When so, I was reading, I'm like, wait. Yeah, so that? FINRA is the regulatory agency, right? So, like, any investment bank um, that is our chartered bank um, has to deal with the regular. So, the SEC is the Securities Exchange Commission. FINRA is a re- was an additional regulator. And what they do is they're making sure that everything is in proper place, right? So, documentation, auditing, uh, when companies come to the portal, we have a process in place to run diligence and so forth. So, um, seat at the table, the team we meet with Finra on an annual basis. They're they're monitoring everything uh, on a monthly basis. You know, whether it's media, whether it's um, it's what we put on the website, whatever the case may be. But they're they're there to ensure the safety of the public, right? To make sure that because what they don't want is like anybody just to pop up and create an equity crowdfunding portal and start aggregating dollars, mm-hmm. right? And not be uh, you know, good stewards of capital. So that's what they do. So they they basically regulate the process. Yeah. Can, you, can you talk about what equity crowdfunding is for people that might not understand? Sure. So I mentioned uh, Kickstarter and GoFundMe. Those are donation based crowdfunding sites. And actually, you know what I should mention? Uh, Fun Black Founders is another donation. I've got to start thinking about us, right? Or I continue to think about it. Fun Black Founders is another donation based crowdfunding site. And what they do is that they'll donate, an investor can donate, us as a community can donate to the companies that we like. And then when you donate, you may get some swag or like a t-shirt, you right? Just like some kind of like perks, right? Um, but with equity crowdfunding, you literally own a piece of the businesses that you're investing in, right? So it's um, when President Obama was in office, he signed what's called the Jobs Act. Mm-hmm. Uh, Jobs Act took many different forms. One of the benefits was it allowed for non-accredited investors, and I'll describe accredited versus not, non-accredited investors to be able to invest in businesses. So historically, um, when you think about, you always hear people talk about VC, like I want to give venture capital access, private equity access. Historically, that was only available to wealthy individuals. So people that made $200,000 or more, right? Um, or they had a household income of $300,000 or they had um, assets of a million dollars, right? So you would hear these crazy stories like, oh, I invested in Uber 10 years ago for $5,000 and now I'm worth $50 million. But the reason why you were able to do that because you were an accredited investor. I'm sure I can circle up five thousand dollars among many of my friends, right, mm-hmm. to have that opportunity. But when President Obama signed the Jobs Act, it allowed for non-accredited investors, so people that make less than that amount, to literally invest in the companies that they consume, the products that they consume as well. So, equity crowdfunding is um, more broadly is uh, the ability to invest in companies at lower dollar amounts too. So you can come to the portal, see it at the table, and you can invest in a company for as little as a hundred dollars, 
um, per investment, $250 per investment, or $1,000 per investment, which um, is different from the old world when you had to cut a $25,000 check mm -hmm. to be invested in one particular company. So now, as investors, whether accredited or not accredited, you can actually spread those chips around, right? It's like, that's the cool part about it, too, is like now you get to diversify your venture capital portfolio, and you really do have the opportunity to be an investor, early stage investor in early stage companies and, and experience that growth as well. So when you are uh, non-accredited, is there still a limit amount of asset? That yeah, you have to have? so, like, so you know, FINRA SEC is on it, so it's typically like 10% uh, of, of, your, of your income or your net worth, right? Mm -hmm. and so like when you go to seat at the table, there are a couple questions and they'll ask you like, you know, what's your net worth? Have you invested in equity crowdfunding in, in the past? Because you are capped. Mm -hmm. FINRA, they track that information as well. Um, it's such a new space, equity crowdfunding. Yeah. So last year, companies can raise up to a million dollars. This year, you can raise up to five million. But what's cons what's consistent about the space is that the regulators are trying to protect the investors, right? And it may feel heavy handed at times. Because hey, Ernest, did you know that the black community has $2.7 trillion of spending power? Are you ready to see what you can do when you combine and recirculate our resources to expand the pool of black excellence? I know I'm ready. And that's why we've partnered with Greenwood the in-demand black-owned digital banking platform. Greenwood's namesake was founded in 1906, built from the brilliance of black dreamers looking to create a self-sufficient community in the Greenwood district of Tulsa, Oklahoma, AKA Black Wall Street. Today, Greenwood is a digital banking platform with the mission to strengthen the black dollar using the same community reinvestment strategies of the original Greenwood district. And it's powered by a best-in-class mobile app that allows you to bank from anywhere. So earners, if you're ready to build a new legacy of black economic achievement, go to bankgreenwood.com slash EYL and sign up to be a part of the new Greenwood community. That's bankgreenwood.com slash EYL. Don't wait. Don't hesitate. Head over there now. Like, Why do I want to be limited? I want to invest all my bread in, in this particular startup, but they want to make sure when you think about venture capital that, and this is my just recommendation, that you only invest what you can afford to lose and not really be bothered or, or, or constantly focused on, yeah. right? And so, you know, there's a lot of intentionality in terms of like the disclaimers that you have to check, the education that you have to check when navigating the website to make sure that you're not going above your means in terms of investing in, in, in equity crowdfunding. Because like most, with venture capital, what, we, what we've been learning is that most of the time it's not gonna work out at all. Like if you invest in 10 deals, nine might not go anywhere, but yep. the, the one, that does work out, that can make up for all of the ones that don't work out, yep. but then even more so. And, you know, so, and so, so, you know, my day to day, I work with venture capital firms and like due diligence and like look at, help them evaluate the companies that they're getting ready to invest in. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but that's the VC model, right? So, like, they get, they raise, they have a, a 50 million, 100 million, you know, $200 million fund, and they literally are making a million dollar investments across, you know, 100 names or whatever the, the math works. And they're spreading their chips and they just want one investment or hopefully, you know, 10, whatever the case may be to be like a 100x return. They know that the majority of those investments aren't gonna turn out to anything, but all you need is one to be 100x. So, you know, what you just described is, is the VC approach where, you know, day-to-day -day investors should take the same approach, where it's like, all right, you have $10,000 that you wanna invest, you could invest in one company, but in terms of like ease of mind, why not invest $1,000 across the table, yeah. right? And like, and hope that one hits, and obviously like at a 20x or 30x to offset the math. Yeah, just got a bad 10%. Yeah. <laughs> so, like, as far as people have an understanding, like, when they're actually invested in the equity crowdfunding, can you talk about, like, a safe note or, like... Yeah, so so I think... So there's, there's, there are two audiences, right? So there's the, the investors that come to the portal that want to invest in startup ideas, right? When you come to our portal, it's primarily diverse, um, backed entrepreneurs. And then there are the entrepreneurs themselves that are trying to raise capital. So uh, what you were just describing is a vehicle, a safe note. It's... um. A vehicle to raise capital. So you can do a safe note. You can do a revenue note. You can do. A, you can do. We're talking about equity. You can also do loans as well, right? So as a business owner, I own X Y Z company. Um, what I'll do is I'll say I'm going to raise a million dollars. It's going to be a, in the form of a safe note. So it's basically I forgot what the S is for, but it's a, for agreement for future equity, right? So it's a document that says, hey, you invested ten thousand dollars, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's all contracted up, and you know what's important on a safe note. This this document, you can go to ycombinator.com, they have them available for, for, for companies that are thinking about issuing through them. Um, it outlines the, the specifics of the investment. The company is worth $10 million, that's often considered a valuation cap, right? It has a conversion trigger of a million dollars, right? And, and then it has- your, What's the conversion I'm trigger? Going, yep, and okay. it has your investment amount. So, so uh, a $10 million company, right? A valuation cap, you invest $10,000, right? right? Or you invest $100,000, right, on a $10 million company. What you'll do is you'll take your investment amount and you'll divide it by the valuation cap 
and that's your ownership, right? So it's you know it's uh it's at a hundred thousand dollars divided by ten million. Mm -hmm. That's how much of the company that you own, but you're not on what's considered to be the cap table. Like you're not listed as an owner until it actually converts into real equity. You just have this document that the safe note that entitles you to equity. So the conversion trigger is. You're, you're just a paper holder until I do my next round of funding, right? And it has to be a million dollars or more because your trigger was a million dollars. Mm -hmm. So once you do a next raise or maybe you get bought out or maybe somebody comes in and invests $3 million, that's when you convert to equity. But what ends up happening is when somebody comes in, they say, you know what? I'm going to give you $5 million for, um, we'll say, 10% of your business, right? So that means that you're worth, you know, if you can't think of $50 million or whatever the case may be, right? Your math is still divided by the $10 million valuation cap. You're not diluted. So what the safe note does is just really outlines what the, what's entailed in the investment, right? Sometimes when people raise capital, they literally let you come in and be on the cap table, right? And you are like from day one, an equity owner. Uh, what's, what's hard about kind of cap table management is a very expensive process because you have to get a valuation audit, right? So when many startups are starting their business, they don't want to pay 40, 50K to get the business or 30K or however you work the math to get the business value. They rather extend these safe notes, which allowed me to say, hey, I'm able to raise capital. It's a contract between you and I that says you're entitled to X amount of dollars of, of exposure, right? Cap, because you have that valuation cap. But it's something that just documents the process. So there are other ways to document it, but safe notes are, 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 are fairly popular. We uh, see the tip, we don't endorse one vehicle over the other. But when you think about like in the early VC stage, especially when you're trying to like minimize startup costs or minimize legal costs, the safe note is probably one of the What's the other one? You, you said, said a safe note. A, re a revenue note, yeah, right? Yeah. So, or, 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 or just a debt note. So what's interesting to me in this space is that, so when you think about your business, right, you can go to, you can try to go to the bank. I want to talk about that process. You can try to go to the bank and get a loan um, and they'll give you their terms or whatever the case may be. They'll look at your financials for two years. They want to make sure that you have reoccurring revenue and so forth. Uh, and they'll give you a standard loan. You're going to borrow a million dollars and you're going to pay 10% interest, right? So, and you guys know this better than I do, but like as a, as a debt holder, you are constantly you know, worried about paying that the monthly payment or whatever the, whatever the payment may be on that 10%, right? With a revenue note, you can often structure the repayment based on the revenue that you make. So as opposed to saying like, hey, every year I'm paying $100,000, 10% on a million dollar loan, I'm only paying, and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take 25% of my you know, yearly revenue, right? And I'm gonna allocate that 25% to paying down the debt. Right. And so for entrepreneurs that are just getting started, that are cash strapped, it's like, all right, well, money didn't come in. I still got to pay the bank this 10 percent. It alleviates that burden where it's like you're only paying based when based on the amount of revenue that you've accumulated for that year or that month. So what the revenue note does, it once again, it documents the process, but it allows the entrepreneur to pay back capital based on their revenue as opposed to like the monthly or the, the time frame perspective of it. You said something about uh, valuations and process and how expensive that is. And we've spoken about valuations yeah. before in terms of how profitable it could be if your company has all these things in terms of how they'll be evaluated. But yeah. what's the actual process like? Yeah, like, I, I, think it's, I think it's worthwhile, man, just to talk about like the entrepreneur's process in terms of getting access to capital because it's, it's hard, man. Like, it's, it's, I think you know, we are encouraging entrepreneurship and I will continue <coughs> to encourage entrepreneurship for the people that it works out for, but there are four main verticals. Um, one is we exhaust our own you know, savings, 401ks, credit cards, balance sheets, and so forth, right? Two is that if you are fortunate to have like a robust friends and family network of wealthy individuals, you'll, you'll tap your friends and say, hey, I'm doing this friends and family round. We're doing it via safe note. Um, we'd like to raise $500,000, right? Third is that you go to a bank and you're like, hey, I have this business that's revenue generating or not. That's profitable or not. The bank's like, that's great, but there's no recourse. There's no assets to serve as collateral. Like if the loan were to fall apart, how does the bank get paid money. back, right? So it's a very frustrating process. They want to see like two years uh, of income statements, right? And like in, in any instance that they can't bank, you'll say, okay, well, you can put your house up as a form of recourse. And we still need a second signature as well, as well, right? So like access from a banking, a traditional banking perspective is very challenging. And then fourth is venture capital. And so with VC, we talk about it often, but it's hard for anybody to get VC capital. And it's particularly hard for black and brown um, entrepreneurs to get it. And, and in all fairness, with the VC community is my clients. I work with them on a day-to-day -day ba basis. What they're often saying is that, you know, not just like it's not a fit, but what they're realizing more importantly is that we as a community rush to venture capital too quickly, right? Because what, what ends up happening is like, I have a business, you know, money is going out, no money is coming in. I tapped on my savings, I, you know, kind of went to friends and family, around. I can't get a loan from a bank. I hear that VC is cutting checks. 
right? Like, how do I go about getting that money? And so, but you still haven't established product market fit yet. You still haven't got your business up and running yet. So uh, we don't necessarily have the luxury of operating in the red, right? Whereas our majority, you know, counterparts, they can be down for a year or two years and they can still operate because somebody's going to inject capital. But to your question about the process of getting, uh, you know, valuation or just like the, how arduous like documenting stuff is, right? Mm-hmm. So we think about the restaurant owner, bar owner, or the, you know, the widget manufacturer, you know, they're operating their business, but when they're trying to raise capital, they got to get their paperwork uh, documented. So obviously, you know, um, formation in terms of the, the type of company it is, there has to be an audit that takes place in equity crowdfunding. Um, if you raise zero to $250,000, it can be self-reported financial. So like, hey, I'm the CEO, this is my income statement, this is my balance sheet and so forth. When it's 250 to a million, um, it has to be CPA reviewed. So you have to pay a CPA to review it mm-hmm. for the last two years. Uh, if it's a million to five million, it's a full CPA audit, right? So to your point, like, like what's the process? Like, what is it about? The CPA audit can be very expensive, right? Somebody's going to charge you $20,000, $15,000 just to evaluate your business um, and um, to, to, to really get an understanding of the financials of the business so you can submit it to the SEC. So if you're raising a million dollars and maybe you're not even revenue generating yet, and I'm saying like, hey, in order to raise that million dollars, you got to do a CPA audit that's going to cost you 20 k You got to create your safe note with an attorney, which we advise, right? That's going to cost you, you know, another 15 to 20 k mm-hmm. right? And then there are some other, you know, ancillary costs as well. It's a very expensive process in addition to the fees that any equity crowdfunding portal will charge you for providing space to facilitate that transaction, right? And so, you know, you may raise, and this is like getting, like talked about through legislation, how expensive it is. For folks in general to raise capital, especially for you know startup companies and, and diverse entrepreneurs, like we just don't have the cash available. Like we're in this process as we as an entrepreneur, we're in this process to get access to capital, but now in order to get it, I gotta you know pay up so much, yeah, spend yeah, so yeah. much. And and in all fairness, though, you know when you go to a bank, that's what they want to see. They want to see statements. They want to see your inventory, right? They want to make sure that your affairs are in order. Um, although with equity crowdfunding, it's just as rigid and like the uh, the diligence process is the same. Uh, but at the same time, the, we are not as particular about who we allow to, to access capital, right? Because once again, we're just a platform that allows individuals to raise from their network. So and that's one thing we didn't talk about is like the beauty of equity crowdfunding is that it allows you to monetize your customer base, your followers as well, right? If you're a popular person and you have a business or an idea, it's like, yeah, you can go to a bank or try to go VC because that's what we're taught to do. But like, why not start at home? And like now... You know, many black folks haven't been in a position where we can literally call that wealthy. I don't have a wealthy uncle, right? But it's like, you don't necessarily have to call that wealthy uncle. Like, call your friends as opposed to doing a $300 dinner for a person, like, have them invest in your company, right? And then um, what's also beautiful about it beyond actually raising the capital is that now you get a form of advocacy, right? So it's like now you have, you think about your your customers, they love your product, they love your show, they're going to listen no matter what, right? They're going to consume it. But imagine how vocal somebody would be to say, you know what, I love the show, I love the product. You should love it too. But also, I'm an investor in the show. I'm an investor in the product. You should love the product and you should think about investing as well. So now you got people carrying the flag on your behalf, right? As opposed to getting one check from one individual and like the money is good, but there's no advocacy. So I think that when you think about how to drive new customers, new following, you know, equity crowdfunding is a is a very it's a viable like a viable uh, outlet in terms of from a dollar perspective and from like a crowd you know mobilization perspective. Yeah, so yeah, you, you spoke about ancillary fees and you said that the 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 equity crowdfund platform that's hosting it charges you to have yep. the, the platform. So is there like an industry standard that they charge yeah. to ha- have you host? So typically, uh, what, what based on the research that the, our team has done, it's about seven percent. It can range from five to ten, you know. But 7% on average, at seat at the table, uh, we charge 7%. The way that we do it, though, is a bit different from the, from the industry. Uh, so let me kind of talk about the nuances of seat at the table. So at seat at the table, we're a portal like any other equity crowdfunding portal, but we tout uh, this concept of family, right? So when you go to the website, you'll see you know, 20 to 40 different profiles. And so what the family members consist of like bankers, attorneys, people that worked in CPG for 20 years, um, you know, marketing, like industry experts, people that had X's on their end. So when you, as an entrepreneur, you come to the portal, you're trying to raise capital, we provide you with access to the family. So now if you have a hair care product, I, there's somebody in the family that worked at, you know, or a makeup product, somebody worked at, like, at L'Oreal for 20 years. And so they can help you think through logistics, operations, and things of that nature. So we charge 7%, just like anybody else does. But what we do is, if you raise a million dollars, it's 7% of the, of the amount that's raised. So you raise a million dollars, that's $70,000 in fees, right? But what Seed at the Table <clears> does is that 
50,000 is a check is in cash, a seat at the table. The other 20,000 is in the form of equity, the same safe note that you've extended to your community. Because what Seed is thinking is that, hey, we are long-term investors and we are long-term partners with our community. It's not about the one-off trans- transaction. We're putting so much sweat equity and we're making so many introductions that we want to see you be successful beyond the actual like raise itself. So to answer your question, 7% um, standard, I see the table, it's 7%, but it's 5% cash and then 2% um, in terms of like equity, uh, 2% of the raise amount in terms of equity. So as far as for people that are looking to invest, what is some of the education that they need to know? Like as far as to, you invest a thousand dollars, what does that equate to as far as like a percentage breakdown? Yep. When should you expect to get your money back? How, you know, just to kind of, because I think a lot of times people, especially equity crowdfunding, it's it's important for people to be educated. Sure. So they don't have misleading expectations. I mean, that's what's like, that's what's dope about your shows by education. I ain't like, that's all I'm doing is educating. So, um, funny, shout out to the teacher. I taught one year high school math. Okay. By Dominguez High School in Compton. Uh, Yeah. Like, home of Tyson Chandler. Yeah, exactly. A bunch of, a bunch of stars. Yeah. 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 Dominguez, bro. Um, but you know, so I'm big on education. So like, I'm educating the investors, which you were just asking about, but we're also educating the entrepreneurs about getting your paperwork in order, right? Doing the audits and like, how do you structure, like what to use a save note, revenue note, but to the question about educating the investors. So you're just like, you're asking like, so I talked about what's your ownership. So you got to take that, if it's a safe note, remember the valuation cap divided by how much money you put in, right? That's your ownership in the company. Um, when you think about investing in equity crowdfunding, you should only invest what you're willing to part ways with, right? It's not like a stock. You don't, you're not tracking the ticker on a daily basis, right? Um, it, you know, typically with private, you got to think about like with private investing in general, it's something that you're going to hold on to in, in perpetuity or hold on to forever, right? And so the way you get paid back, um, and this is like one of the questions you were like, what should people think about? You should always, regardless of if you're doing PE, VC, any type of investments, you want to ask the person like, what is the exit opportunity? Like, how am I getting paid? Like, what does that look like, right? If you're going to invest in a company. So typically it's either, you know, the company that you've invested in has gotten bought by a strategic, right? Meaning that a company that's already in the space that says, hey, you're doing something really interesting. Let me buy you. Um, or like more notably, we know like people go IPO, Right. Or in many instances, companies fail. Right. And it's like that's like and so you have to like literally lock in on the possibility, the strong possibility that the company won't be successful. Right. So that's why the disclaimer about invest only what you're willing to part with. Know that you can't trade it. There's no secondary market. Like it's not like I buy a piece of, of my favorite coffee shop. I invest in a piece of my favorite coffee shop. I can sell it to you. The, the industry isn't there yet. They're, they're still evolving. Right. But it's like the benefit to me is like, hey, I own a piece of this coffee shop. Maybe the way that it was either a debt note or maybe they just structured where they're giving out dividends. Sometimes you can get paid cash. Like mm-hmm. the investments can give you dividends, but you are literally an owner in that bar or that coffee shop or any other you know, product that you consume. But to answer your question again or to be more concise about it, yeah, it's like there's no secondary market. You're going to own it for – ideally, you'll own it forever. Um, you get paid when the business sells. Very similar to like – um, you know, a real estate transaction. Like you know, when you own a piece of a house, when you own the house that you're living in, you don't actually make money – on the house that you're living in until you sell it. And you're hoping that you're selling it at a higher price so it's than two, what you it's, bought it. It's really like two ways how, like in a VC world or in this world, how you really make money, right? It's sure. either a company goes public or a company is purchased. Yeah, up, right? yeah, I mean, or like, purchased by strategic. Yeah, yeah. so, um, like and so I, Amazon buys PillPack for a billion dollars, yeah. Nas makes some money, or when Coinbase goes public, Nas makes money. Yeah, and there's so many companies, there's so many transactions, man, that are occurring. That you would never even know. Or another option is like a private equity firm comes in and they and they buy eighty percent of your company. You're still selling to them, right? It's like, um, but there's so many and those like those transactions often don't get. They're not in the press, right? We hear about the big names and the, the IPO companies that are doing transactions, but there are businesses. I think a sweet life for an entrepreneur man is to do a, have a business doing a million a rev, ten million a rev, whatever the case may be. Employing people, like which is a big, you know, kind of like delineating factor, mm-hmm. um, having a decent lifestyle, and then maybe selling it. To another, you know, strategic for thirty million dollars. Whenever you, you, whenever you choose to, right? It may not ever make the press, but like that is a notable transaction. And going back to the original point, a middle market banker, a smaller investment bank would do that transaction yeah, yeah, yeah. for you. Uh, but they're basically bringing capital to the table. Like they're from another institution. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, no, okay. Yeah. So you, you said employing. Yeah. And so I know that's something that you know that you guys do very intentionally. Yep. Right. So you hire bankers, yep. attorneys. Talk about that process of not only investing in the community, but Hiring from the community. Man, well. I'm I'm all about us. So my you know my dentist is black, my attorneys are black, my estate planners are black, my real estate you know mortgage people are black, right? Like I'm very, I'm I'm like I'm very stern about us as a community, especially notable individuals, right? 
applying pressure to say that, hey, if I'm giving you, if I'm working with you or engaging with you, I want to make sure that my coverage person is somebody that looks like me or somewhat familiar, right? And so, like, we can't be embarrassed by that because it's happening for everybody else, for sure, right? And so, in that respect, yeah, like, I, like I'm tapped in. I have, you know, uh, for people that are coming to the portal, we have, you know, black and brown um, securities attorneys. We have black and brown CPAs that we like to recommend. Uh, we have black and brown um, operations consultants as well. Uh, but we try to keep it in-house to the extent that we want to at least say that we made an effort to reach out to somebody like us. Uh, it doesn't always work that way. Like there's still some needs that I have, uh, but we're continuing. Like we're, we're like the way we're situated is that we're facilitating introductions and we're facilitating capital, right? So it's like, hey, as an entrepreneur, I have this particular need. The first thing I'm going to think about is like who within like the affinity network that I can position. So I see at the table, the family is you know 30 to 40 people that are industry experts that are like you know, well-resourced individuals. Mm -hmm. And we literally are bringing entrepreneurs into our ecosystem, right? Maybe you didn't go, maybe a neighborhood dude, you didn't go to you know, XYZ school, right? You don't have access to like all these individuals, but like we make sure that regardless of what your background is, that we're actually inserting you into our ecosystem, into yeah. the network that we have. Yeah, that, because that was gonna lead to my next point was like, is there a criteria to be on the platform, right? Yeah. So like, maybe I didn't have this background and maybe I, I'm, just started my business, my first business. Is there criteria to be on the platform? Yeah, we are. We are. We are a bit more. We are not a bit more. We are definitely more patient and friendly in terms of you know our process of onboarding uh, companies. So I would like we are tapped into the community. We are intentionally created for the community, right? So when I say that, because there are other equity crowdfunding portals that are very stern about seventy thousand dollars in revenue, right? Before you before you're able to come onto the portal, uh, we don't have revenue minimums. Um, I would say, and we, there's no education credentials or anything like that that's required. Uh, we, our process is that you'll apply, you come on the portal, you create a campaign, it's re, it's, uh, you'll submit your business plan or your, your pitch deck. We review it internally with our diligence team. There's a bunch of interviews back and forth. We circle it up among uh, the family and everybody can kind of like, like, like talk about the idea and, think of, and, and you know assess their interests. And then we onboard you, uh, but when, like there's a lot of handholding that does not exist um, among uh, other portals as well. So to, to, to go back to your question, there's no profile requirement. I find that companies that are like uh, direct to consumer or e-commerce companies perform better in equity crowdfunding more broadly because it allows for that advocacy fact. Right? Like, not only does it taste good, yeah. right? Like you should like it because it tastes good as well, but like I'm also an owner in it. Yeah. When it's like, yeah, it was you got like, that shirt, you an owner. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah. Like when it's B2B, it's like you can't really see it, right? And you can't really mobilize your base. So like, or if it's an app, I think apps work really well because now you already said, like, I got 100,000 users. Like, the first thing you should be asking for capital is your 100,000 users, right? But the mindset is, yeah, ask them for capital. But really, and this is what I think is uh, important for entrepreneurs, really the story is you are making space for those 100,000 users that you have to participate in your growth journey as an entrepreneur, right? And I think that what ends up happening in our community is that we get these dope businesses and I, I'll support any black business. I'll support you without even knowing you. Right, because like I'm all about us, right? It's so, like you know, you get these businesses that are coming up, and like you know, what? we got to buy that product because it's black owned, brown owned, right? But I think it's the entrepreneurship possibility to say like, hey, support me because I'm black and brown, and because the you know the quality of the product is great. But in return, I'm going to provide space for you to invest. So as my company grows, you can say like, hey, you know, I was doing eight million dollars of revenue ten years ago, and now I'm doing eighty million, and you were an investor then. And so when I sell to a strategic or I IPO, you are an owner in the space. So it allows entrepreneurs to make space on their cap table or to make space in their company for their community, their their family, their friends to be investors and to like really be in the car with them as they're going down the road in terms of you know succeeding as a business. So like what was the steps that you did to start? I know you had some speaking of funding, you had some um, like Baron Davis yes. a friend of ours, um, Ryan from the Gathering Spot. Yeah. What were the steps that you took to get see um, at the table, off the ground, and up and running. Yeah, so shout out to to Marin Davis, L.A. notable. Um, like he's a he's a he's a human, like a normal. I like normal people, man. Like I walk, like, yeah, I, I share the room with many different people, mm -hmm. and um, I think what's important in life, man, is like when you are not in the room, like how people are talking about you. Like, if you say like, oh, I met Pierre, ninety nine percent of the time they're gonna say, oh, he he tried to be helpful to me without asking anything back. And Baron is, you know, e equally yoked in that respect. No, so a couple other ball players, like there's another guy named Anthony Tolliver. Uh, known Hooper played for a while in the league. Yeah. Um, and then and the other investors, our family, are just folks like us, like literally bankers, attorneys, right? That said, like, hey, I, I know there's tons of entrepreneurs out there that want to get access to capital. 
how can I be of help, right? So that's what that family looks like. And those are the best. So for me, it was me finally making an ask of my network and saying like, hey, this is what we're putting together. Um, I, I want to make space for you to participate, but also I want to like, I, I need to like raise this capital to offset the cost, right? Mm-hmm. And so people came and they knocked on the door in abundance. I was like, I was humbled, man. Um, it was you know, oversubscribed uh, in both instances where, where there was capital raise. And, um, but it was by virtue of the network that I created, right? And by virtue of like me managing relationships. And so for any entrepreneur, whether you're raising capital or not, like you're managing relationships, whether it's your vendors or your customers. So I created a, a, a very healthy uh, network of just like solid individuals. Um, and then I was, you know, fortunate to have people that were aligned to Seed's mission to come in and, you know, to provide capital and to provide insight, right? So like providing capital in terms of dollars, but I think like network and the expertise is just as important, right? And so we created something special, man. And so when you come and you partner with Seed at the table, it really does feel like you are sitting among family, uh, like the handholding is, 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 is needed and it's true. Um, because I said, you know, being an entrepreneur is such a, a, a lonely part. There's so many things that you don't know. Like, I didn't know anything about the space, right, as an entrepreneur. And so, like, the best way to avoid pitfalls is to ask somebody that already went through the process, right, and get to learn from their experience. So that's what the, the seed family really serves that. So they're not just, like, investors um, in terms of seed, but they're also the network that is available to every issuing company and available to me. Like, I, they're, they're my sounding board as well. So navigating the platform from two different perspectives. From if I'm a, if I'm a business owner and I want to get on your platform, what do I do? Um, all right, so I create a username, password, and log in. So I have to do like a bio of the company. I have to say like how much money I'm looking to raise. Exactly. Like what's what's you have to say how much money you're looking to raise, whether it's going to be debt or whether it's going to be equity, right? Which investment vehicle you're going to use, whether it's a safe note or um, a revenue note or whatever the case may be. Um, you have to identify like the industry that the business is in. And then once again, it is reviewed by our leadership team um, and, 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 and experts within that space. Like we literally have expertise covering any industry, right? In terms of the family and or I've seen it in terms of the deal flow, the diligence uh, work that I do uh, in my other capacity. Uh, so you'll come in, you'll sign up, as I mentioned, it's reviewed. Uh, we'll have conversations. Uh, you, you pitch formally to, to the family, right? Or to the leadership team within the family. Um, and they'll say that it's a good fit for the portal. So the, the we're not the family is not a gatekeeper. They're not going to say, "Oh, you're not going to be." And so it's hard. It's like we're not going to tell you that you're going to be a viable business or not. Like we're not. Nobody can do that, mm-hmm. right? Um, what we're really trying to assess is: Do you understand that it is an active process in terms of raising capital? So are you structured in your thought process? Do you have your document your documents in order? Do you have the story in order so you can go out there and successfully raise capital, right? Because the challenges for many entrepreneurs is, is that we think it's easy. I got the best idea. I got the best business. And you should believe in your business because nobody's going to believe in your business more than you will, right? But we often are, um, we, we're often, there, there's a misconception that, you know, I'm going to go out there and put my name on this portal and people are going to rush in droves to raise the cap. Like, nah, you got to, it's hand in hand, right? You got to go out there and literally, like, you know, uh, talk to folks, raise capital, tell them your story, right? And so, and that's what we always whether that's that seat at the table or some of the, you know, more kind of notable. Uh, platforms out there, you're literally driving 95% to 99% of the investors, right? The portal is literally just legal space, right? For you to transact, for it to be documented by the SEC and FINRA. And so the best way to describe see it at the table versus the competitors, it's like us like throwing a party, right? So everybody, have, everybody, all these portals have ballrooms at the Ritz Four Seasons or any other kind of venue, right? Um, when you go to, we go to WeFunders, uh, when you go to their, their ballroom, it's going to have more people there because they are like they've been known for a while, but you don't really know what the music is going to be, mm-hmm. right? When you go to see it at the table, it may be less, but you know they're going to be playing Nas, you know, they're going to be play, playing a little bit of Kendrick, mm-hmm. right? A little bit of Nip, right? It's like so like I'm handing you the ox, right? And it's like and so like you know the you know the who's you, on the ox? Yeah, you know the, you know the, you know the, it's literally the communities for us, right? And so and people are going to be a bit more patient because what ends up happening is that when you do launch and you list on a port on a on a on a platform. You want to make sure it, the story that you're telling aligns with the audience, right? And so, you know, we are intentional about the people that we serve, black and brown, diverse entrepreneurs. We understand that there's a little bit more handholding that is required for that community. The audience and the ecosystem that we surround them with are reflective of that. Okay. So, um, so hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, so you go on, you create a, a profile. We, we evaluate you. We're assessing fit more so in terms of your ability to raise capital. Not in terms of like, is this, this is going to be like a hitter. It's just a 10x return. So it's, like the, it's a yeah. betting process. Yeah, it's a betting process. And, and so and then we're submitting the, the documentation for, uh, through the SEC for you and FINRA for you. Um, and then as an entrepreneur, so once you go and you raise a million dollars or $100,000, 
I mean, there's no investment minimum. You were asking like in terms of pro- there's no invest there's no raise minimum. I should say. Mm-hmm. Right? We typically like to stay above one hundred thousand uh, dollars because it's like it's a lot of time. And it's a cost to us, right? Uh, a million is like the sweet spot. But what I was getting at is that when you're invest- when you're raising capital, um, when you go through the equity crowdfunding process, what you're required as an entrepreneur, besides being a good steward of that capital and operating your business, is that you have to report to your investors uh, once a year for two years. And you just have this, your annual investor letter, like this is how the business is operating, this is what you know what we're doing. And you have to do that for two years, and that's filed with the SEC, and then after that, you're done. And so then also, <clears throat> excuse me, also as an entrepreneur, you can raise up to five million dollars. But for example, if you raise, if you want to kind of get your feet wet and say, like, you know what, let me raise under two fifty, so I don't have to do the expensive audits, right? And just to kind of get a feel for the process, you can do that. And then within that same year, you can still raise up to another four point seven five million dollars. So it's five million dollars per year. And or next year, you can go back and raise, I wouldn't encourage this, you can go back and raise another $5 million, right? So um, <clears throat> that's the, the dynamics or the structure of, of how things are situated. Yeah, you, you said, and Charlie said this, he said there's two ways in this business, right? Either you're going to get bought or you're going to IPO. Yep. And we haven't really or seen- Or fail. Or fail. Or fail. No, no, failure is not an option. It has to work. It's loosely defined, too. It yeah. has to work or it has to yeah, work, yeah. right? And so we don't really see many- Black and brown companies IPO. Yep. And so when you're on Brona and you're betting, are you looking at the company saying, yes, this potentially can sell one day or be bought one day? Or are you looking at it, or in addition to, are you looking at like, I can see this company IPO in one day, right? Yeah. So, I mean, 99% of all businesses in America are small businesses. Mm-hmm. So that means that they're not like publicly traded, right? Um, yeah, we're definitely looking for, for companies that we believe can be hitters. Um, we, like, we're, we understand how hard it is to get to that point. We know how hard, like, so... We're not saying we're not we're not only that's always getting it. We're not only onboarding companies that we think are gonna be hitters. So right? we're onboarding companies that are successful, they're providing service to the community, uh, they're providing product, um, maybe they have the opportunity to to get sold by strategic. I think so what ends up happening is that the investors that come to the portal to invest, those are the questions that they have to ask, right? So we're literally we're providing the menu of of, of investments, right? But they have to run diligence on their end in terms of what success looks like mm-hmm. and uh, really assess whether it's gonna be the next big thing. Or if it's going to be something that I own that's kind of cool that I own it, I can kind of tell my friends that I own it as well, and hopefully it gets bought out by a strategic. So, um, is there any scenario where somebody is investing in a company and they can make money if the company isn't purchased or if it doesn't go public? Like if the company just still remains <coughs> private, but it's yeah. an extremely profitable business, is it like dividend? Like, is yeah, there, it, is there's there any scenario where you can still make money if the company is not purchased or so, does not go public. So twofold. So we decided to start a bar, <clears throat> bar. You know, whether whatever barrel you want to be in New York, but we decided to start a, start a bar in Brooklyn. Right, we're gonna have everybody go there as owners. We can say like we're gonna do distributions, right? Like you know, monthly distributions based on the revenue. So as an owner, as an as an as a founder, you have that ability to do distributions as well. Um, I'll give you a, a, a more a, a better example. When you think about like there, real you can do real estate through equity crowdfunding. As well, you're like, you need to think about all the people that are in that space, and you guys both know it better than I do, right? It's like, hey, I want to go buy property outside of Tuskegee, right? I want to buy a $30 million or $10 million, you know, 50 unit, you know, piece of property, right? Now you can aggregate your friends and say, hey, we're going to buy this structure. We're going to raise $5 million of equity, get the rest in debt, whatever the case may be. We're going to create this entity to get the, to raise the equity, and we're going to buy this property. And so the rent roll, Right, can be sent out as distribution. So yes, you can do that through equity crowdfunding. We're looking at uh, a franchise, like there's a food franchise company that we're, a food company that's one that's franchising, um, and they're getting ready to build a new location, and they they want to create an LLC or an entity that's going to allow them to raise capital, right? And so that entity is going to be a co-owner in that food franchise, right? And there's going to be distributions that are paid. So it depends on how you as an entrepreneur structure your business. It's literally the equivalent of I came to you and I'm like, hey, I own this bar. You're like, all right, like how do we get paid? Well, we get paid by distributions back to, to the investors as well. So, and then from, all right, so we talked about it from a business owner, but from an investor, the process, they go on the website, Yep. they create a username, password, they fill out a list of yeah. clients to make sure that they're not hurting themselves by doing stuff that's too risky. I like that. Yeah. And then is there a limit to how how many companies they can invest in? Or? Yeah, it's a. Uh, so after the, the 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 last question first, you can invest in as many companies that keep you below that threshold based on your income, right? Ten percent or whatever the case may be. Uh, <clears throat> but the process, the reason why I kind of got excited because I'm just reminded. So when you go to the when you go to any portal, you're gonna send you know you know populate your name, your birthday. They're gonna ask you for your social. 
like in a mini in our community, like, yo, like, why are they asking for my social? Like, I can't just go on Amazon and go buy, like, you know, it's like buying a, pro a product on Amazon. It's different. <laughs> and the reason why they ask you for your social because, like, there are KYC laws, like, know your client laws, right? And money laundering and so forth. Once again, this is a FINRA SEC governed process, right? So we want to make sure that the money is coming from exactly who they're, <clears throat> who it's supposed to be coming from. And it's all in good standing. So they'll ask you for, like, that demo information. It's all safely secured. <clears throat> and then you go on the portal and you see whatever company that you like. And you literally click invest now and a prompt you want to pay by wire. You want to pay by credit card. You want to mail in a check, um, and then once you once you submit invest now, you make your payment. Then you receive um, a document that says you are an owner in X Y Z company, and then obviously that owner receives your information, and they're required to interface with you um, for the next two years, at least once a year. But you can invest as many companies as you want, just uh, contingent upon your own balance sheet. Is, uh, is there a number of companies that you're looking to have or host each, each year? <clears throat> yeah. Is it like a quota, like we, uh, this is the, the goal for the year, we want to have this many companies? So the, the family wanted to have 10, so they had 10 this Who, year. Who's the family? So the family's a 30 or 40 like yeah, yeah. individuals, so it's literally um, the network, right, of, of, of people or resources that are available to every issuer, right? Okay. So like there's a leadership team of seven, like CMOs, you know, chief onboarding per person and so forth. But in terms of the the collective network, right? What they want to do, and like I said, it's like the way you should think about it, man. I, so I'm from I'm from LA or you know, Long Beach specifically. Um, my I, my parent, my grandparents came from Texas, right? When they came from Texas, my, my grandfather was a World War II vet. When he came to uh, when he came to Long Beach, <clears throat> they all passed all people from Texas in his community all passed the hat to build a church, right? And so like the family effectively passed the hat to build the church uh, seat at the table, right? And it's like mm -hmm. a place where we can call home and so forth. So that's what I mean by that. Gotcha. <laughs> so, um, but no, the, 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 what was the, I'm sorry, what was the question I was wondering you that is the question as was- As far as how many- uh, I mean, this, companies, companies yeah, so the goal was like, initially to have 10 in the yeah, first year, and yeah. we've accomplished that. In 2022, we want to have at least 20. Now with this show and some of the other media that we're starting to do, it's gonna be crazy, right? And so, like I said, we are, we are, we're, we're not gonna tell people no without reason or we'll, we'll say you know probably it's not the right time you got to think and be a little bit more thoughtful about how you're going to raise your capital but what we do is that we'll literally hand you to other resources that to get you ready right like what's well, so it we ask the next question and we take the next step so to answer your question we want to have at least 20 companies on the portal in 2022 um and then you know 23 or probably 20 to 40 right but we don't want to make it like we're like we're focused on volume because we still want to be we want to have the ability to touch every company right to the extent that they want to be like touch and have the support um so like it's a, it's a fair balance but ideally 20 20 companies for this year so i just want to ask a question sure. about the, your your day-to-day -day job yeah you do venture capital diligence evaluation yeah. for a portfolio <clears throat> what can you just talk about like what what exactly is that so yeah so uh so my day-to-day -day is it's, it's pretty cool man in the sense that like i'm no longer wearing a suit and tie i'm like hoodie I get to show my tattoos wear air back you know i mean like and so we're gonna at a digital marketing agency and they have this machine AI like that's been around for nine years. And what it can do is it can forecast revenue growth with 90% accuracy. So what it does, it'll latch onto a company's analytics, like Google Analytics, Google Ad, email, Shopify, and so forth. And it'll say, based on this data, <clears throat> if you invest this dollar amount over this time frame in digital marketing, it's gonna produce 10X in, in dollar figures, right? Return with once again, 90% accuracy. So my clients are you know, the, the, the Carlisle's, TPG's, you know, um, you know, Blackstone's of the world, right? Venture, big venture capital names or capital sponsors. And what they do is they come to us and they pay us for the technology and they say, hey, can you evaluate this company that we're going to be either buying or investing in, right? And mm -hmm. so we'll come in. All I see is deal flow in terms of companies that are doing a million dollars in revenue that's getting ready to get proper VC money. Our company that's doing a hundred million dollars in revenue that we consume or a billion dollars in revenue. But they'll take that technology and what it does is that the tag is called Nova. Um, what it does is that it'll de-risk an investment, right? So now it takes the guesswork out of like how much, if we bought this company, how much we had to put into the digital marketing, right? Uh, and so what's pretty what's cool about it for entrepreneurs, and uh, you know we we make sure that uh, the seed family, or sorry, the, family, the seed entrepreneurs that come into the portal, they have access to that technology <clears throat> at a discount rate, of course. Uh, what's cool about it is take it takes the guesswork out of your use of proceeds slide. So when you think about like an investment pitch book, I'm sure you guys have seen plenty of them. They're typically like ten to fifteen slides. There's always that one slide where it's like use of proceeds. And like the use of proceeds slide is like this pie chart. It's like, hey, I want to raise a million dollars. 50% is going to go towards headcount. 25% is going to go towards marketing. The other 25% is like towards some other ancillary calls. That 25% towards marketing is very vague, right? And so with Nova, it literally specifies which digital marketing channels, which sub channels that you're going to run, which time frame, and more importantly, what's the return on that investment? So you raise a million, you're putting 250000 towards digital marketing. 
Uh, Nova will tell you that if you put the two hundred fifty thousand that you put into marketing, it's going to return a million dollars, like a four x return or two million dollars, right? So mm -hmm. now when you go to your investors and you're trying to raise capital and you're asking them for money, like, hey, so the, the investor knows that if I cut you a check for a hundred thousand dollars, twenty five percent of that is going towards digital marketing, and it's going to res result in you know two hundred thousand dollars or whatever the dollar, whatever the the the, the ROAS or the return on ad, on ad spend may be. So Nova. It's strong AI, been around for you know for nine years. Um, so all I do is talk to P and VC investors and literally attaching that technology to their investment, their diligence process. Like they're doing like operations, logistic, uh, financial diligence, like looking through the numbers and we are purely coming in and looking at digital marketing diligence. So um, I don't know, I, I, I always like to come bearing gifts and we, we talked about this a little bit earlier, man, but I'm a big fan of the show, I'm a big fan of like the education and the mentoring that you all are doing. So what I would like to do, so the technology uh, Nova typically goes for like 20 to 40,000. That's what I sell on a day-to-day -day basis. What I would like to do is I, I would like to extend, uh, Nova, it's called Nova Diligence. I would like to extend uh, a Nova Diligence audit to one of your one of your, your students, right? And you guys can determine what that looks like and maybe you announce the winner. Or maybe we go to the, the gathering spot, we go to Hilltop in LA, right? But like we announce the winner, but like yeah. once again, it's like uh, you, you guys are, are, are work with so many entrepreneurs. So, you know, it's an opportunity for them to, to, to you know, get their use of proceeds slide together, run this technology. If it's a like a B2B company, it can pro it can approximate uh, lead leads, like you know, lead um, lead generation with 90% accuracy as well. So it doesn't have to be e-commerce, D2C. It can also work in the B2B space. But the seat of the table family would, would like to cover the cost of um, one of the Nova Diligence for, for one of your students. So uh, have I appreciate that. Appreciate that. Right, man. Appreciate yeah. that. Yeah, well, what we'll do is somebody from EY University, because we have like 12 other people in there. So yeah. a lot of business owners are in there. So we'll find a way to kind of see who would be the best fit. Sure. Um, <clears throat> and then, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll extend that and connect the dots on it. Yeah, man, I would say tap in with us, seatofthetable.com, um, at seat of the table on all social media platforms. You can find me on LinkedIn, Pierre Laveau, L E space V A U X. I'm pretty active on there. Um, yeah, people that know me, man, I'm always like about passing information, passing the ball. So, like, there's some way I can be helpful, um, even if it's not a fit for seat at the table. Like, there's so many people in the network that I think that um, I just like to see us work together, right? And so, if there is a company that, you know, is not in a position yet to raise equity profit, that's okay. There are tons of other resources that I know of. Um, for example, uh, the company that worked the nine to five uh, Power Digital, we have an accelerator. Right, that I help. I was instrumental in creating. We're taking slots. I mean, like I've been positioning all my friends to get in the accelerator. But like, you know, we love to extend that to your network. So with that accelerator, what they're doing is they're uh, the the digital marketing shop is donating two hours of, of free digital marketing services per month. Right, mm -hmm. and so like now you can talk about your paid search, paid media, and you can like get the expertise or have access to expertise. Uh, so we're taking we're taking participants for that accelerator. There are tons of like resources that I've come across. In the, in the network as well. So um, I want to make sure that I continue to be an extension uh, of all of you and an uh, extension of everybody else that's in your network too. I appreciate that. So what's next? What's next for a seat at the table? <clears throat> Man, we're, we're trying to you know, onboard as many companies as possible, help them raise capital. Uh, you know, I, I can't go into too much detail in terms of like the financial uh, trajectory of the firm, but ideally, you know, we think about our premise is making space for the community to participate in the products that they are consuming. Um, ideally, we will make space for the community to participate in you know the economics of seat at the table. So that's definitely forthcoming um, within the next year. When what I mean by that is like the opportunity for the community to actually invest in seat at the table, mm. right? Um, <clears throat> so like that is critical to us. Uh, you know, we pride ourselves on being communal. It's not about one person, right? And that's why you keep hearing me say family, family. It is. You know, it's like it's, it's like it's family. about like making sure that everybody has space. So. Yeah. More users, more investors to come to the portal to invest in the amazing companies that we have, right? But still being diligent about their process and understanding that they can lose money. You got to get educated. Always got to give that disclaimer, right? <laughs> but also, a company is coming to the portal um, that are raising capital, and then you know they raise capital, and we continue to be helpful to them after they raise, right? So, five years from now, we can say that we launch, or even three years, or three or four years, we launch a hundred companies, and one or two are bangers in the sense of like <clears throat> an IPO, or maybe they do like a prop, like a a crazy series A for 25 million or a B for 50 million. And I know that I was able to provide a platform. We were able to provide a platform where the community was able to like participate 
in that journey, like that is success. Is it only black companies? Black and brown. So, I'm, you know, huge, like anything of the diaspora. But with that said, uh, we are opening it. So I just got an email from a, from a gentleman who's like, hey, you know, I'm, I'm not a diverse entrepreneur. Can I come to the platform? I'm like, yeah, you definitely can. And we, we, we're open to it, but we are just very intentional about making sure that there is the space. Fo- the focus is for black and Yeah, so we don't, like, anybody can come on anybody the portal. Come yeah, on. but the focus is to make sure that we want the community to know that we exist. Right. And for the uh, in comparison to the other uh, poor portals that are out there, you know, we understand your journey. Right. We understand your challenge because what ends up happening, man, especially within VC, a lot of the service providers, you're like, oh, I want to raise X amount of dollars. They're like, oh, just go ask your friends. Or like, it's like they, there's a lot of things that that business or excuse me, that demo takes for granted. Right. That isn't really relevant to our community. Right? It's like, oh, like legal costs are only fifty thousand dollars. Like that's expensive. Like I don't like I don't have that <laughs> right now. Right. And so. <clears throat> we're a bit more patient in the sense that you know, we understand like how burdensome or expensive that can be to you. So we're going to pr- try to provide a resource to you that is a little bit more cost friendly, right? As well. But yeah, anybody can come to the portal. Uh, we just, I think it's important, man, to be like you know intentional about the service that we're providing and that the community that we're focused on. And this is so. What's crazy is that this is before all the uprising and everything that happened over the past year. So Seed was actually approved by SEC and FINRA in December twenty. Uh, 2020, they didn't go to the public in terms of like putting companies on the portal to uh, July of 21. So you think about that time frame, there was so much money sloshing around in terms of like, you know, guilt money, right? In terms yeah. of like, yeah, all these firms, companies like, you got to spend money. Yeah, these firms, like, yeah, I got to, yeah, it's so like, yeah. so the team was like, they're anxious, man. Like, like, we should like really get it up there. That's the clubhouse is still kind of popping a little bit. Like, you know, like, they're like, oh, we need something for us, like a portal for us to support our businesses. And we were anxious, we wanted to go, go to market. But we were very intentional on our end to make sure that the user experience is flawless. It's very similar to like working like with the Goldman, right? In a sense that we didn't want to rush the market and have any mishaps or any glitches. So we were very patient, man, and wanted to make sure that everything was in place the right way before we went to market. So open to anybody, but we are intentional to make sure that the community knows that we exist. Yeah. Rather than asking for a seat at the table, you created the table. Literally. And planted the seeds. Yep, literally. And that's oh, like that that's is that, that is the goal, man. And um the name resonates randomly. I mean, I, I, you know, I appreciate the album, but like, or the song, but like, the name resonates. Like, we literally don't have a seat at the table. And so, when I was a banker in New York, I used to see so much. Like I said, I used to see so much deal flow and so many opportunities to generate wealth. But I was the only dude in the room, right? And I didn't always have the bag enough to participate, right? But like, I knew so many people that could, and I felt I was just frustrated by it, right? And I think that you know, now we're in a position that <clears throat> continue to ask, you know, institutional, or excuse me, ask. Uh, the institutions for capital, you can go that route, you should, right? Or at least consider it. But now be mindful of the fact that you can literally raise among your own community, right? Um, and like that's like that's exciting to me, right? To, 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 to create something and allow space for your community to be involved in, um, but also to allow, and along those lines, to allow them to like really participate in the growth journey, right? And like to really be an owner in something. So everybody doesn't have $25,000 to make that minimum friends and family investment, but you may have a thousand. Right, and or you can you know you can you can kind of accumulate it from a volume perspective, as opposed to just being one person or cutting one check. Uh, that's dope. So I encourage everybody at least just to check it out for educational purposes. Yep. Go on the website, <clears throat> look, read, do your due diligence. You might say, okay, this this is a sports company. I find this interesting. Right. I find you know this is a, a company that's specialized in how to you know bring farming to the new age technology. You know, it's, it's a good education because I'm assuming like they have bios you can actually read. Yeah, and you interface with them and everything. It's all like, it's all, it's all the, pump, pump, the comments have to be public. SEC can like, so like, and I encourage you to go on, you know, talk to the companies, ask them what their exit plan is, right? And like, I, like ask yeah. them, like get up to speed, educate, like you guys are all big, big about education, like educate yourself and you have the ability to interface uh, on the portal as well. Um, yeah, go there, learn, reach out to us. We are, we continue to look for companies to onboard as well, right? Um, you know, I, I would never be overwhelmed by by the amount of companies that reach out to us because at the end of the day, even if they're not a fit for us, again, you know, we're happy to hand them off to somebody else that we think is a, is another is a better fit. So please continue to you know keep us in mind um, when you know that when that person is asking you like when your friend is asking you to raise capital, say hey, have you ever thought about raising through seat at the table? Um, and it's a great resource, especially for people that get hit up all the time like, in terms of, like you know being investors. Like now you have. A platform where you can raise a, a where entrepreneurs can raise among their community, their friend networks, and so forth. Appreciate it, brother. Can you tell them again, like with the website? Yeah, man. Uh, table.com It's uh, Seed S E E D um, on IG, uh, LinkedIn. It's uh, at Seed at the Table. Um, you know, you can email us uh, email us at info at Seed at the Table.com. Uh, You know, I see all the emails. The team sees all the emails. 
but tap in with us, man. We are we are among the community. You know, we are everywhere in terms of the family. Like you know, we're, you know, we're uh, we're here to be a, a resource, and I and that's one thing. And like, I'm glad you know we're we're talking about this out loud. We're trying to do more media, right? Because we've been like very stealth mode in terms of, like you know black folks work really hard, work really hard. And I'm gonna show them in the end, right? Now we're you know <laughs> making sure that we kind of show them now because it's important for us, the community to know about us as opposed to going to the competitors. Like oh, had I known. Out of work with Seat at the Table. But yeah, uh, seatatthetable.com, um, at Seat at the Table on all you know forms of social media. Please em- email us if you have any questions, want to get up to speed, want to learn a couple of things. Um, and you know, do your research, um, you know, understand the risk of equity crowdfunding, and just you know, make sure when you're talking to entrepreneurs, you always ask, like, what is the exit opportunity? Appreciate it, brother. Troy, how's yeah, writer? I got a good feeling that those emails are gonna yeah, ramp nah, up after this. Yeah, one. Nah, I love it, man. <laughs> like, I don't say that. Like, I, like I said, even if it's not a fit, man, like there's like there are other like either donation based crowdfunding portals or like like incubators that I think are worth you know the conversation, right? So um and there are tons like even like you know, positioning firms to work with you know giving them access to no- besides the one that we are we're sponsoring for you guys, like giving them access to Nova, right? It's so, like when man when I was a banker at Goldman, like they let me in the shop. I used to like always try to like quote unquote hook people up and like like put them in like to conferences that they part historically wouldn't been able to be in or rooms that they historically wouldn't been able to be in. And that's the same way like I navigate seat at the table. That's the same way I navigate um, you know Nova technology. Like if I can be helpful and I know that you know it's going to add value to somebody else, like I'll and I know that the person I'm giving it to is going to be responsible and it's not going to be a waste. I'm gonna plug you for sure. Yeah, man. So shout out to the family. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> shout out to the family. Sounds like a mafia, right? Yeah, <laughs> I love it. It's like yo, it's almost like a syndicate. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. shout out to the family. Shout out to all the earners on uh, EYL University. I know we love y'all. Yep. There's over twelve thousand members there, so I definitely, I'm sure they're gonna check this out. And I uh, shout out to the entire merch team. Obviously, you see we got some some drip on. Yeah. Shout out to our, uh, our stylist Mike B, who's been hooking us up with that. We got some some real cool stuff coming and uh yeah man love is love thank you for all the support man we'll be back with y'all next week yeah. congratulate you both on what you've accomplished and like i said we 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 we've come across each other and we like shared same similar spaces um <clears throat> but what I, what i mentioned what's important is like what people say outside of you right and it's like obviously you're doing this but like at the same time people are like yo they're good dudes it's like humans right it's like like that's like that's capital that's well for me now like i saw that like i saw a form a, a, a aspect of the bag when i was working on wall street like I got little ones, man. It's all about like legacy. Like, you know, I want somebody to pull up on my son and my daughter, like, yo, I know your dad. He was he did XYZ. He didn't ask me on the back, man. Yeah, so yeah, I you yeah. know I tip my hat to what you guys have accomplished and actually what's in store. So definitely want to make sure I'm tapping into you. Thank you, brother. Yeah, man, appreciate love. it. Yeah. yeah, shout out to my man Lou Tucker once again. <laughs> Lewis, Lewis, nice E Y L Lewis. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Thank you guys for rocking with us. We'll see you next week. Peace. Peace. My graduates from my school being Forbes. Backdrop. Backdrop. <laughs> A mic drop. Bag drop. Bag drop.